This presentation is called, What is W? From Hamilton's Rule to Axelrod's Rule, Part 1. In this first part of the presentation, we're going to answer three questions. First, what is Axelrod's Rule? Second, what is W? And thirdly, how does Axelrod's rule compare to Hamilton's rule? So as we've discussed, uh, we've identified two roads to cooperation so far. And one of those is inclusive fitness. And inclusive fitness turns on close genetic relatedness. We've also discussed reciprocity in this segment of the course. And what's important about reciprocity is that it does not turn on close genetic relatedness. So it gives us a way to try to model the evolution of cooperation without relying upon close genetic relatedness. In relation to this, we're going to introduce a new model and we're going to call this Axelrod's rule. Although that label isn't generally in use, it's very helpful for our purposes. And Axelrod's rule states that altruism can evolve when W times B is greater than C. And you'll see why I'm calling it Axelrod's rule, because it's so similar to Hamilton's rule, which we've already discussed. Now, in point of fact, this inequality was developed by a mathematician named Martin Nowak. And it isn't, again, generally referred to as Axelrod's rule, but it all goes back to Robert Axelrod's work in his book, The Evolution of Cooperation. With that said, I highly recommend, uh, if you are interested, to take a look at Martin Nowak's book, which is called Super Cooperators. So our question then is how does W differ from R? So in Hamilton's rule, we have R multiplied by the benefit, which has to be greater than the cost. And we know that Hamilton's rule turns on R. And at this point in the course, you know what R is. So we don't need to discuss that again. Axelrod's rule, then, we're going to say is W times B must be greater than C. And what we don't know at this point is what W means. So this is our first question that we have to answer. What is W? Let's define our terms here. We'll start with the letter B. And just as in Hamilton's rule, the letter B stands for the reproductive benefit that goes to the recipient of an altruistic act. So B has the same meaning in Axelrod's rule that it does in Hamilton's rule. And in both cases, our primary interest is in reproductive fitness. This is how we're measuring our cost and benefits. Similarly, the letter C in Axelrod's rule refers to the reproductive cost to an altruistic donor. So again, this is just cost-benefit analysis. And so far, two of the three terms are identical in Hamilton's rule and in Axelrod's rule. So we have one less, last term to discuss, and this is the one that makes the difference. So what is W? Well, W is defined as the shadow of the future on our present activities. So if we have two agents, one is orange and one is blue, and orange has acted in such a manner as to benefit blue, the question that W answers is what is the probability that the altruist who received that benefit will encounter the recipient again so that they have the opportunity to reciprocate. So what we're saying here is that orange has acted altruistically towards blue, 
W refers to the probability that orange and blue will meet again and blue will have the opportunity to reciprocate. How then do we define W as a quantity? Well, we can use this set of inequalities. W is any number that is greater than zero, but less than one. So we can push W as close to zero as we want to, but we can't make it zero. And on the other hand, we can push W as close to one as we want to, but we can't make it one. And to illustrate what we're meaning by this, if W equals 0.5, this means that the probability of the two actors meeting again is 50%. And if W instead were equal to 0.9, this would mean that the probability of the actors meeting again is now 90%. So it's very high. And if W is equal to 0.1, then the probability of the actors meeting again is only 10%. So as W gets closer to zero, the likelihood of meeting again gets closer to zero. And as W gets closer to one, the likelihood of meeting again gets very high. So here's one way that we can think about this. And let's begin by rewriting this inequality in the same manner that we worked with Hamilton's rule. So now we'll say that W times the benefit less the cost is greater than zero. And this is just how we worked our examples with Hamilton's rule. So imagine then that W is 50% and that the cost is one unit of fitness or one offspring, uh, what does the benefit have to be for it to be possible for cooperation to evolve? And what has to be the case then is that 0.5 times the benefit has to be greater than zero when one is subtracted from it. And a simple way to think of this is that if W is 50%, the benefit has to be greater than twice the cost in order for this inequality to hold. So the cost is one. If we make the benefit three, then certainly the inequality holds because 0.5 times three is 1.5. And if we subtract one from that, we've still got 0.5 left and 0.5 is greater than zero. So if we're thinking in terms of whole offspring and W is 50% and the cost is one, the benefit has to be three or higher. Now let's imagine uh, now that we're going to push W higher to 90%, what's going to happen to this equation so now we're taking 0.9 times the benefit and subtracting the cost, and there has to be something left for Axelrod's rule to hold. So if W equals 0.9, that means W is 90%, and the benefit must be greater than 1.1 times the cost. So we can put 1.1 in there, but that uh, benefit has to be more than 1.1, and if that's the case, this holds, and this lets us draw a conclusion. As we went from 50% to 90%, the cost and the benefits came much closer together. And we can say then that as W approaches 100%, as it gets closer to one, the benefit comes closer to the cost. And we can interpret this to mean that when the likelihood we will meet again is high, altruism can evolve more easily, and that's because the cost-benefit ratio is so close. And that's a fairly intuitive idea that it's going to be easier for reciprocators to benefit one another if they meet 
frequently. So let's compare that finding to Hamilton's rule. And in Hamilton's rule, we found that altruism could evolve most easily when the relatedness was high. So when R is largest, Hamilton's rule is most powerful. And a similar thing holds in parallel for Axelrod's rule. If we're looking at the evolution of altruism, that's going to be most easy when W is large. And what this means is that relatedness and the likelihood of meeting again are operating in parallel ways in these two models. So now let's imagine that W is small. So we reduce it down below 50% all the way to 10%. And if W is only 0.1, then what does that mean about the benefit? Well, it means the benefit has to be greater than 10 times the cost. And in terms of the numbers that we're using in this particular inequality, it means that the benefit has to be a number that's greater than 10. So we can come as close to 10 as we want without, going, without the number being 10. Maybe we would use 11. And this leads us to our second conclusion. And this is that as W approaches zero, the benefit is going to exceed the cost by an ever greater amount in order for this model to work. And let's compare that finding to Hamilton's rule. So we found with Hamilton's rule that inclusive fitness had less impact as relatedness approach zero, and we said that as relatedness approach zero, inclusive fitness is very hard to calculate in a meaningful manner. Similarly, with Axelrod's rule, as the probability of meeting again approaches zero, reciprocity will have less impact on the actor's behavior. So again, both of these models are operating in parallel as relatedness or the probability of interacting again gets smaller, the significance of inclusive fitness or reciprocity also become less. Now there is another way to calculate W, and we're going to discuss that in the next part of this presentation. Thank you for listening.